Kaiji no Kami, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Mill Creek's recent Blu-ray releases of Mega Monster Battle and Ultraman Zero. In the mid-2000s, Tsuburaya Productions suffered many hardships that led to themselves being sold to another media company known as TYO. TYO had little to no interest in the Ultraman franchise and instead decided to sell a show revolving around the franchise's favorite monsters to a premium television network in the hopes of obtaining more subscribers to that network. Unfortunately for them, Mega Monster Battle was considered an utter failure as audiences were not interested in paying to watch a series that did not feature their favorite warriors of light despite it being full of fan favorite monsters like Gomorrah, Red King, and Ella King. Thus, TYL sold half of Tsuburaya Productions to Bandai and the other half to a pachinko company, both of whom capitalized on this endeavor through a series of follow-up movies and specials that introduced Ultraman Zero, the son to Ultra 7. The idea was to keep the franchise restrained to movies to ease the marketing and production for widespread distribution without having an excessive amount of costs involved. As we all know, the Ultra franchise would prove popular enough to be returned to a yearly television event. How is Mega Monster Battle? Is it a worthy addition to the Ultra series? Or should you run away from it? Let's take a look at it to find out. The Heroes. Mega Monster Battle features a quintet of space explorers from an organization known as Zap Spacey, one of whom can summon and control monsters. His name is Rei, played by Shota Minami. Rei is first introduced to his Zap cohorts by exiting the corpse of a monster. <laughs> It is never explained why he was inside of a monster, he just was, and at the start of the series he has no memory of who he is. All that is known about him is that he can control monsters using a device deemed a Battleizer. Not to be confused with the Battleizer of Power Rangers. <laughs> Over the course of the first season, we come to learn about his origins and why he is able to control monsters. While the second season forces his crewmates to help him overcome his urges to cause wanton acts of mass destruction. I can't exactly say Ray is the most engaging character of the franchise, as he's pretty one-dimensional as far as personality is concerned. He starts out with a one-track mind, only to find himself enjoying his time with his fellow Zap members, while the second season does give him a bit more to work with, at least until his main obstruction is complete. Then he pretty much becomes stagnant. The problem with Ray is he's He's just not interesting. He's boring. Of course, I would be lying if I said Ray's four partners are any better, as they are not. I like the entire crew, however, outside of their commander, they're not given much material to work with. The commander, Hiroshi Hyuga, is easily my favorite of the team as he is an outgoing personality that allows actor Hiroyuki Kanushi to show off a wide array of personality and emotions you don't always see from the one in charge. <laughs> We aren't given much insight into his backstory, yet the presence he maintains on screen more than makes up for it. He is also the main reason Ray is successful in stepping away from the dark side of the force. It also helps the man has a brilliant voice that can overtake any oncoming threat. <laughs> Seriously, I was expecting there to be a monster who ran away from hearing Hyuga shout. Next up is Hyuga's second in command, Jun Haruna. Haruna is the super serious hard ass who would often be disciplined for disobeying orders she did not agree with. <laughs> Oh my god, I wish every soldier thought this way because then there wouldn't be a lot of unnecessary deaths in this world. 
She is also the only one who requires Ray to prove himself before she is willing to trust him, which naturally occurs quite early on, and a relationship is hinted at that will never come to fruition because Japan. Throughout the first season, we come to learn that her brother has disappeared on the planet our team has arrived on after receiving a distress beacon. One of the earliest ruins they investigate is the one her brother was stationed at, leaving the team believing him to be dead. <laughs> Saki Kamiro does a decent job in a row, even if the moments when she has to act goofy can come off a bit over the top, as was the case when an alien Zorab impersonated her. <laughs> Our remaining two members are Masahiko Kumano and Koichi Oki. While Toru Hachinohe hasn't done much outside of this series, you may recognize Kumano's actor, Mitsutoshi Shundo, for he has been featured in Kamen Rider Amazons and Ultraman Nexus. Sadly, there isn't too much to talk about with these two beyond their gimmick. Kumano is the ship's mechanic who has been nicknamed Wizard for always being able to fix their ship in the direst of situations. Power <laughs> Oki, on the other hand, feels like he is there for comic relief and nothing more. It is revealed that monsters have been extinct on Earth for the last 50 years, and despite this, Oki went to college to become a monster expert. This prowess allows him to become the audience's exposition whenever a monster shows up, as he will get all excited at the sight of a beast, naming it off and sometimes sharing the details of that monster to his buddies. <laughs> Thank the gods this aspect ended up staying fun rather than annoying, as it could have become such real fast. Oh. The Monsters and Aliens. It's an ultra show, so there's monsters. And aliens. Go figure. All of your favorite monsters and aliens return. Gomera. Ella King. <laughs> Litra and Miklis are all controlled by Ray. <laughs> There's also Red King. <laughs> Goza. Naranga <laughs> Twin Tail <laughs> The Flower from Ultra Q <laughs> And a Metron who has one of the best scenes in the entire show I can't think of any reason for that not to exist as a rage quit meme. And the pet on return with an armada of Black King Joes, obviously deemed King Joe Black. <laughs> Although there is a red one in the mix, which no one seems to acknowledge. Anyone? No? Alrighty then. We do get to meet the pedons that control King Joe, which is kind of cool since we never really saw them in Ultra 7 outside of being in the shadows, with one of them named Dial being one of the few villains to actually be fleshed out. Although, actor Kosei Kato does need to dial down his acting. Common yeah. Rider and Sentai fans will most likely recognize two other villains in the show, Kate and Grand. Kate is played by Mayu Gamo, who was one of the Tachibana sisters in Hibiki, along with playing Succubus in Deca Ranger. 
そんなロボットに負けたら承知しないよ。レイ。As for Grand, Mitsuru Karahashi was one of the lead orphan acts in Fies, along with playing Juzo and Shinkinger. Kate's nothing special as far as villains go, as she doesn't do too much, while Grand is just over the top in badassery and fun. I don't know what it is, but Karahashi clearly had a blast playing his character as the man brought pure joy to the screen every time he was on it as he really chewed his scenery. It was actually quite interesting to see him play a goofball as opposed to someone super serious as he had done with Juzo. <laughs> Effects and music. For pretty much being shot in front of a green screen, the effects are not that bad. They're undoubtedly better than a certain other Toku show that is currently airing as I speak. There was only an occasional moment here or there where I found the green screen to be cringe worthy. <laughs> The CGI effects for the ships and stuff could be better, but again, they aren't as bad as other shows I know. Explosions are solid for the most part, as are the few miniatures to be had. The biggest issue I have in the effects department really comes towards the end of the second season when the Paydons send out their armada of King Joes. On one hand, it is pretty damn awesome watching a countless number of King Joes on screen at one time. Alternatively, the execution was unable to live up to the ambition. It just looks so silly as clearly the production team was just pushing King Joe figures in front of a camera. A for effort? Or should I just do E for epic failure? Even the music doesn't seem to be as engaging with the show compared to others, and I'm not sure why, as Toshihiko Sahashi has produced numerous toku and anime soundtracks that rock. He's done the big O, Car Ranger, Kuga, Agito, Hibiki, both Gundam Seed Seasons, and Magic Knight Ray Earth. I should say the music here is fine, just nothing noteworthy. <laughs> Why am I hearing music from Resident Evil Zero here? Actually, it seems like Sahashi only did the music to the first season, while the second season was done by several composers, which includes Nobuhiko Moreno, who was responsible for the Sky High movie soundtrack I reviewed a while ago, along with a few other Ruhei Kiramura films. <laughs> Each season has its own opening and closing song, and I can't say any of them truly grasp me. The first season's opening is sung by Project DMM, and it's titled Eternal Traveler. Rakazan sings the closing Jump Up, which sounds like a Hollywood Studios bad rap movie trailer music got stuck in my Ultraman show. Keizo Nakanishi sings both the opening and closings to the second season, which includes Chikai. And I know Surushi. And I'm bored. The episodes. The first season of Mega Monster Battle takes place on a planet the Zap members are sent to after receiving a distress beacon, while the second takes place on basically a planet that's made for a monster tournament. Not the craziest idea I've ever heard. 
Well, I was not as enthralled with the show as I had hoped, I can't say there was a single episode I truly downright hated as such. Instead of talking about my least favorite episodes from the series, I'm going to tell you my top favorite from each season. My favorite from season 1 is titled The Underwater King, which is the episode that first brings Ella King. It's a simplistic story as Ella King is just fighting other monsters and kicking ass. What makes it my favorite though is the monster fights that take place beneath the water. They are well shot thanks to its aquatic setting. <laughs> As for my favorite one from season 2, that easily goes to Grant's introductory episode, The Strongest Rayonix. Without going into too many spoilers, Rayonix is the name given to those who can control monsters. Grant finds himself bored as no one seems to be able to provide him with a challenge, and he hopes that changes as he antagonizes Ray after easily beating up Dial. As I said in the Monsters and Aliens section, I love Grant's charisma so much that this episode was a blast to watch, especially when he notices Bray's Battlenizer looks completely different from everyone else's. Oh, and he also calls for a timeout at one point. One major annoying aspect of the show I want to bring up is that every time a monster appears on screen, a dead card of sorts is displayed. Normally, I wouldn't have an issue with these, except it happens every time with every monster. And I mean every monster. Even Gomorra, despite being featured in every episode. I didn't mind it initially, but by episode 10, I was so sick of seeing Gomorrah's data file. The worst part is sometimes it would pop up twice in a single episode if he was summoned twice. Like seriously? The movies and specials. There are a lot of movies and specials to cover, so here goes nothing. The first movie is a direct follow-up to the TV series called Mega Monster Battle Ultra Galaxy the Movie. Say that like 10 times fast. The movie reintroduces audiences to the Ultra Brothers in the Land of Light, giving an origin story of sorts to them. And evil Ultraman who was sealed away by the name of Balio is awakened and uses his own Battlenizer to resurrect 100 monsters to attack the Land of Light. He gives his brethren the cold shoulder, leaving Ultraman Mabius to recruit Rey in order to help stop Balio's evil plan. We also get to see Ultraman and Seven in their human forms again, which is cool. And as mentioned earlier, Zero makes his grand entrance in this adventure. What's even better is it features pretty much every Ultraman you could ever want, as long as their names are not Tiga or Nexus. Nevertheless, it's a solid tale overall, even if they probably could have shaved about 10 minutes off of its runtime. Next up is the two-part special with the even longer title of Ultra Galaxy Legend Side Story Ultraman Zero vs. Dark Clops Zero. Wait, so is it Dark Clops? Dark Clops? or Dark Lops. I'm confused. Anyway, Ray and Hyuga find themselves in an alternate universe that is connected to the multiverse where the Salome from Ultra 7 have hatched a plan to conquer the entire multiverse using a clone robot army of the original five Ultra Brothers. Zero is there as well, and we also meet for the very first time the Dark Lops who are evil robots that resemble Zero in design. Yeah. 
we also get a Mac version of Gomorrah. So that's cool. After that comes the next theatrical film, Ultraman Zero, The Revenge of Balio. Balio returns once more to trouble the universe and is up to Zero to stop him. In this one, we get the introduction to a set of new characters who will become part of Zero's team titled Ultimate Force Zero, with the likes of Glenfire, Mirror Knight, and John Bott. <laughs> It also features a princess who meets up with two brothers, one of whom Zero takes as a host body in order to conserve his energy. <laughs> Whoa, it's getting a little Phantom Menace up in here. I really enjoyed this one immensely as it felt like I was watching an 80s fantasy film a la Labyrinth or Legend due to how the events play out. Lastly, Ultraman the Next makes an appearance, which interestingly ties the next together with the 1966 original. Ultraman no. Moving on, there is the other two-part special, Ultraman Zero, side story, Killer the Beat Star. Huh? Killer the Beat Star. Not exactly the most impressive title from a grammatical standpoint. This one kicks off a year after the Revenge of Balio and has a robot trying to kill all organic life. He's got his own army of King Joes, along with Ace Killer and another machine, and then creates a clone of John Bot he calls John Killer. Ray and Hyuga also get roped into this escapade with some on-screen technical assistance from Kumano, while Haruna and Oki are nowhere to be found yet again. In the end, I kind of like this one as well, even though it has some pretty bad effects in a few areas. I should also mention that Zero's buddies are voiced by some usual favorites, Hikaru Midorikawa, Tomokazu Seki, and Hiroshi Kamiya. And finally, there is the last movie, Ultraman Saga, which is set on an Earth that has been nearly conquered as all but a small female group of resistance fighters remain. And some kids. Zero, Cosmos, and Dinah have to team up to battle a brand new version of the Zeton, which looks pretty damn cool as if he just came out of Starship Troopers. Shit! Saga was enjoyable, even if I did feel like it was about 20 minutes longer than necessary, there were a couple of hilarious scenes that dealt with Zero and his new host body for this movie. Okay, that is a first. Not to mention Daigo Naito's acting for the new guy is not exactly stellar. That's embarrassing. The Blu-rays. Alrighty folks, here you've got what you come to expect from Mill Creek's Blu-rays. Except not quite, because they feel a bit incomplete. So we've got slip case. We've got the case. Discs in a tray. But no booklet. No digital copy. Same with Ultraman Zero. We've got the movies. With the slip case. We've got discs in a tray, but again, no booklets and no digital copy. Interesting, odd, whatever. It feels kind of incomplete. Audio and video are fine, albeit some of the episodes can look a tad soft from time to time, especially early on. Subtitles appear to be accurately translated, though consistency can sometimes vary. 
The biggest example comes from the translation of Choju. Back on the Ultraman Ace Blu-ray, they had translated Choju as Terrible Monster. For this release, the first season calls them Great Beasts, while the second season has them translated as Uber Beasts. <laughs> There are grammatical errors as seen here. Also, I'm not sure I like the wording used for one of the recap scenes at the start of an episode. Furthermore, the openings, closings, and Oki's discussion about a monster before the next episode previews are not subtitled at all. On the other hand, the songs are translated for the movies, and an English dub is included with the three theatrical films. I see you're on route to Planet Dent. It's very similar to Earth, and could be used as a habitable world for mankind. Right. I've heard it's beautiful there. Hey man, your alarm clock going off? Brother! Enemy battleships closing in. It is too dangerous here. They're from the same studio that gave us the dubs to Ginga S and X, so don't expect anything grandiose. Plasma Spark Tower Energy is how he did it. He stole our power to form a kaiju army? There's no time. Hurry to the tower. Then let's fight! <laughs> What are you saying? You're now the size of a puny little insect. In the end, while I did relish my time with these releases, I can't exactly say they wowed me compared to other Ultra series. Mega Monster Battle was a fine show, albeit a flawed one. Thus, I'm going to give Mega Monster Battle a solid 3 out of 5 bumps and spandex. As for the movies, The Revenge of Balio alone warrants them a 4 out of 5 grown-ups and spandex. That's all I've got. Until next time. Bye.